Chapter 19 of Specimen Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rich Myers. Specimen Days by Walt Whitman. Chapter 19 Starting Newspapers. Reminiscences from the Camden Courier. As I sat taking my evening sail across the Delaware in the staunch ferryboat Beverly a night or two ago, I was joined by two young reporter friends. I have a message for you, said one of them. The sea folks told me to say they would like a piece signed by your name to go in their first number. Can you do it for them? I guess so, said I. What might it be about? Well, anything on newspapers, or perhaps what you've done yourself starting them. And off the boys went, for we had reached the Philadelphia side. The hour was fine and mild, the bright half-moon shining. Venus, with excess of splendor just setting in the west, and the great scorpion rearing its length more than half up in the southeast. As I crossed leisurely for an hour in the pleasant night scene, my young friend's words brought up quite a string of reminiscences. I commenced when I was but a boy of eleven or twelve writing sentimental bits for the old Long Island Patriot in Brooklyn. This was about 1832. Soon after, I had a piece or two in George P. Morris's then celebrated and fashionable Mirror of New York City. I remember with what half-suppressed excitement I used to watch for the big, fat, red-faced, slow-moving, very old English carrier who distributed the Mirror in Brooklyn. And when I got one, opening and cutting the leaves with trembling fingers. How it made my heart double beat to see my piece on the pretty white paper, in nice type. My first real venture was the Long Islander, in my own beautiful town of Huntington in 1839. I was about twenty years old. I had been teaching country school for two or three years in various parts of Suffolk and Queens counties, but liked printing, had been at it while a lad learned the trade of compositor, and was encouraged to start a paper in the region where I was born. I went to New York, bought a press and types, hired some little help, but did most of the work myself, including the press work. Everything seemed turning out well, only my own restlessness prevented me gradually establishing a permanent property there. I bought a good horse, and every week went all round the country serving my papers, devoting one day and night to it. I never had happier jaunts, going over to Southside, to Babylon, down the South Road, across to Smithtown and Comac, and back home. The experiences of those jaunts, the dear old-fashioned farmers and their wives, the stops by the hayfields, the hospitality, nice dinners, occasional evenings, the girls, the rides through the brush, come up in my memory to this day. I next went to the Aurora Daily in New York City, a sort of freelance. Also wrote regularly for the Tatler, an evening paper. With these and a little outside work, I was occupied off and on until I went to edit the Brooklyn Eagle, where for two years I had one of the pleasantest sits of my life, a good owner, good pay, and easy work and hours. The troubles in the Democratic Party broke forth about those times. 1848 to 49, and I split off with the radicals, which led to rows with the boss and the party, and I lost my place. Being now out of a job, I was offered impromptu. It happened between the acts one night in the lobby of the old Broadway theater near Pearl Street, New York City. A good chance to go down to New Orleans on the staff of the Crescent, a daily to be started there with plenty of capital behind it. One of the owners, who was north buying material, met me walking in the lobby, and though that was our first acquaintance, after fifteen minutes' talk and a drink, we made a formal bargain, and he paid me two hundred dollars down to bind the contract and bear my expenses to New Orleans. I started two days afterwards, had a good leisurely time as the paper wasn't to be out in three weeks. I enjoyed my journey in Louisiana life much. Returning to Brooklyn a year or two afterward, I started the Freeman, first as a weekly, then daily. 
Pretty soon the secession war broke out, and I, too, got drawn in the current southward, and spent the following three years there, as memorandized preceding. Besides starting them as aforementioned, I have had to do, one time or another during my life, with a long list of papers at diverse places, sometimes under queer circumstances. During the war, the hospitals at Washington, among other means of amusement, printed a little sheet among themselves, surrounded by wounds and death, the Armory Square Gazette, to which I contributed. The same long afterward, casually to a paper, I think it was called the Jimplicute, out in Colorado, where I stopped at the time. When I was in Quebec province in Canada in 1880, I went into the queerest little old French printing office near Tadoussac. It was far more primitive and ancient than my Camden friend William Kurtz's place up on Federal Street. I remember as a youngster several characteristic old printers of a kind hard to be seen these days. The Great Unrest of Which We Are Part my thoughts went floating on vast and mystic currents as I sat today in solitude and half-shade by the creek, returning mainly to two principal centers. One of my cherished themes for a never-achieved poem has been the two impetuses of man and the universe. In the latter, creation's incessant unrest, exfoliation, Darwin's evolution, I suppose. Indeed, what is nature but change? in all its visible and still more its invisible processes? Or what is humanity in its faith, love, heroism, poetry, even morals, but emotion? Note. Fifty thousand years ago the constellation of the Great Bear or Dipper was a starry cross. A hundred thousand years hence the imaginary Dipper will be upside down, and the stars which form the bowl and handle will have changed places. The misty nebulae are moving, and besides are whirling around in great spirals, some one way, some another. Every molecule of matter in the whole universe is swinging to and fro. Every particle of ether which fills space is in jelly-like vibration. Light is one kind of motion, heat another, electricity another, magnetism another, sound another. Every human sense is the result of motion. Every perception, every thought, is but motion of the molecules of the brain translated by that incomprehensible thing we call mind. The processes of growth, of existence, of decay, whether in worlds or in the minutest organisms, are but motion. By Emerson's Grave May 6, 82 We stand by Emerson's new-made grave without sadness, indeed a solemn joy and faith, almost hotter our sole benison, no mere warrior rest thy task is done. For one beyond the warriors of the world lies surely symboled here, a just man, poised on himself, all-loving, all-enclosing, and sane and clear as the sun. Nor does it seem so much Emerson himself we are here to honor. It is conscience, simplicity, culture, humanity's attributes at their best, yet applicable if need be to average affairs, and eligible to all. So use are we to suppose a heroic death can only come from out of battle or storm, or mighty personal contest, or amid dramatic incidents or danger. Have we not been taught so for ages by all the plays and poems? That few even of those who most sympathizingly mourn Emerson's late departure will fully appreciate the ripened grandeur of that event, with its play of calm and fitness, like evening light on the sea. How I shall henceforth dwell on the blessed hours, when not long since I saw that benignant face, the clear eyes, the silently smiling mouth, the form yet upright in its great age to the very last, with so much spring and cheeriness, and such an absence of decrepitude that even the term, venerable, hardly seemed fitting. Perhaps the life now rounded and completed in its mortal development, 
and which nothing can change or harm more, has its most illustrious halo, not in its splendid intellectual or aesthetic products, but as forming in its entirety one of the few, alas, how few, perfect and flawless excuses for being of the entire literary class. We can say, as Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg, it is not we who come to consecrate the dead. We reverently come to receive, if so it may be, some consecration to ourselves, and daily work from him. At present writing, personal. A letter to a German friend, extract. May 31st, 82. From today I enter upon my sixty-fourth year. The paralysis that first affected me nearly ten years ago has since remained with varying course, seems to have settled quietly down, and will probably continue. I easily tire, am very clumsy, cannot walk far, but my spirits are first-rate. I go around in public almost every day, now and then take long trips, by railroad or boat, hundreds of miles, live largely in the open air, am sunburnt and stout, weigh a hundred and ninety, keep up my activity and interest in life, people, progress, and the questions of the day. About two-thirds of the time I am quite comfortable. What mentality I ever had remains entirely unaffected. Though physically I am a half-paralytic and likely to be so long as I live. But the principal object of my life seems to have been accomplished. I have the most devoted and ardent of friends and affectionate relatives, and of enemies I really make no account. After Trying a Certain Book I tried to read a beautifully printed and scholarly volume on The Theory of Poetry, received by mail this morning from England, but gave it up at last for a bad job. Here are some capricious pencilings that followed, as I find them in my notes. In youth and maturity, poems are charged with sunshine and varied pomp of day. But as the soul more and more takes precedence, the sensuous still included, the dusk becomes the poet's atmosphere. I, too, have sought and ever seek the brilliant sun and make my songs according. But as I grow old, the half-lights of evening are far more to me. The play of imagination with the sensuous objects of nature for symbols and faith, with love and pride as the unseen impetus and moving power of all, make up the curious chess game of a poem. Common teachers or critics are always asking, what does it mean? Symphony of fine musician, or sunset, or sea waves rolling up the beach, what do they mean? Undoubtedly, in the most subtle, elusive sense, they mean something, as love does, and religion does, and the best poem. But who shall fathom and define those meanings? I do not intend this as a warrant for wildness and frantic escapades, but to justify the soul's frequent joy in what cannot be defined to the intellect part, or to calculations. At its best, Poetic lore is like what may be heard of conversation in the dusk from speakers far or hid, of which we get only a few broken murmurs. What is not gathered is far more, perhaps the main thing. Grandest poetic passages are only to be taken at free removes, as we sometimes look for stars at night, not by gazing directly toward them, but off one side. To a poetic student and friend. I only seek to put you in rapport. Your own brain, heart, evolution, must not only understand the matter, but largely supply it. Final Confessions Literary Tests So draw near their end these garrulous notes. There have doubtless occurred some repetitions, technical errors in the consecutiveness of dates, in the minutia of botanical, astronomical, and so on, exactness, and perhaps elsewhere. For in gathering up, writing, peremptorily dispatching copy, this hot weather, last of July and through August, 82, and delaying not the printers, I have had to hurry along, no time to spare. 
But in the deepest veracity of all, in reflections of objects, scenes, nature's outpourings, to my senses and receptivity as they seem to me, in the work of giving those who care for it some authentic glimpse, specimen days of my life, and in the bona fide spirit and relations from author to reader, on all the subjects designed and as far as they go, I feel to make unmitigated claims. The synopsis of my early life, Long Island, New York City, and so forth, and the diary jottings of the Secession War, tell their own story. My plan, in starting what constitutes most of the middle of the book, was originally for hints and data of a nature poem that should carry one's experiences a few hours, commencing at noon flush and so through the after part of the day. I suppose led to such an idea by my own life afternoon now arrived. But I soon found I could move at more ease by giving the narrative at first hand. Then there is a humiliating lesson one learns in serene hours of a fine day or night. Nature seems to look on all fixed-up poetry and art as something almost impertinent. Thus I went on, years following, various seasons and areas, spinning forth my thought beneath the night and stars, or, as I was confined to my room by half-sickness, or at midday looking out upon the sea, or far north steaming over the Saguenay's black breast, jotting all down in the loosest sort of chronological order, and here printing from my impromptu notes, hardly even the seasons grouped together, or anything corrected, so afraid of dropping what smack of outdoors or sun or starlight might cling to the lines, I dare not try to meddle with or smooth them. Every now and then, not often, but for a foil, I carried a book in my pocket, or perhaps tore out from some broken or cheap edition a bunch of loose leaves, most always had something of the sort ready, but only took it out when the mood demanded. In that way, Utterly out of reach of literary conventions, I reread many authors. I cannot divest my appetite of literature, yet I find myself eventually trying it all by nature, first premises, many call it, but really the crowning results of all, laws, tallies, and proofs. Has it never occurred to anyone how the last deciding tests applicable to a book are entirely outside of technical and grammatical ones? and that any truly first-class production has little or nothing to do with the rules and calibers of ordinary critics, or the bloodless chalk of Alibone's dictionary? I have fancied the ocean and the daylight, the mountain and the forests, putting their spirit and a judgment on our books. I have fancied some disembodied human soul giving its verdict. Nature and Democracy, Morality Democracy most of all affiliates with the open air, is sunny and hardy and sane only with nature, just as much as art is. Something is required to temper both, to check them, restrain them from excess, morbidity. I have wanted, before departure, to bear special testimony to a very old lesson in requisite. American democracy, in its myriad personalities, in factories, workshops, stores, offices, through the dense streets and houses of cities and all their manifold sophisticated life, must either be fibered, vitalized by regular contact with outdoor light and air and gross, farm scenes, animals, fields, trees, birds, sun warmth and free skies, or it will certainly dwindle and pale. We cannot have grand races of mechanics, work people, and commonality, the only specific purpose of America, on any less terms. I conceive of no flourishing and heroic elements of democracy in the United States, or of democracy maintaining itself at all, without the nature element forming a main part, to be its health element and beauty element to really underlie the whole politics, sanity, religion, and art of the new world. Finally, the morality. Virtue, said Marcus Aurelius, what is it? Only a living and enthusiastic sympathy with nature. 
Perhaps, indeed, the efforts of the true poets, founders, religions, literatures, all ages, have been and ever will be, our time and times to come, essentially the same. To bring people back from their persistent strains and sickly abstractions to the costless average, divine, original, concrete. End of chapter 19